Well, we're, we're live, so I'd like to welcome everyone uh, to the meeting uh, Wednesday, February 15th, and this is the Senate Agricultural Committee, and uh, so we'll uh, run around the table here and introduce ourselves, and as you folks uh, each speak, uh, you can introduce yourselves, and we'll get started. So. Morning, Brian Collimore, representing the Rutland District. Hi, Irene Renner, sitting in North Plus, Fairfax in Franklin County. Uh, Brian Campy in Bennington County, Wilmington, and London Perry. I'm Rich Westman. I'm from Wyoming County. And I'm Bobby Starr, and I represent Orleans County and four communities in Caledonia County. So, uh, again, welcome you all to the meeting. <coughs> it's, uh, we're going to hear a little bit about the Working Lands Enterprise Fund. And uh, we, well, I was here when we set that up 10, 12 years ago. And uh, it, uh, as most of you would know, it's done very well and been a great uh, program generated uh, what we put 10, 11 million in or something like that. But what it's generated out in the uh, business world has been uh, remarkable. And, uh, so we uh, are anxious to hear uh, from you folks and uh, we have the Deputy uh, Deputy Dog Allison Eastman from the Agency of Agriculture. Good morning, Allison. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Senators. Uh, thank you for this invite and opportunity to talk about the wonderful program that you all created uh, just a decade ago. Uh, it's a program we're proud of at the agency. I'm Allison Eastman, Deputy Secretary. I uh, serve as Anson's designee. Um, if, if you would like, I would uh, be happy, uh, Mr. Chair, to do the run of the show and call on speakers, if that's your preference. Um, will that work throughout to keep us on task? Well, I guess if I don't like uh, your schedule, I'll take over. Excellent. <laughs> that sounds good. And uh, if we could, not everybody that's in the room will be speaking. Um, I would like to quickly just go around the room and especially uh, make sure that everybody understands who represents on the board as well as our staff that work so hard on this program. So uh, we appreciate the, the work and the time that they give. So if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to turn to Elizabeth in the room to make sure that we recognize the folks that are with you today. And then we'll have uh, the individuals online introduce themselves. So your name and the seat you represent would be helpful. Yeah, you are. Yeah, I think actually the a majority of we have, we have what we call the gauntlet going on outside. So we're gonna have people rotating in, you board got members. More out there? We do. Yeah. How many? Um ten. I'll be four or five at least. Okay. Maybe a couple in the corner. Um yeah, and we we were prepared for that. We knew the room limitations. We just decided that it was better to have that face-to-face -face contact. So yes. they'll introduce themselves or we'll introduce them as they speak. Um, but I think, you know, as far as the folks that are in the room right now, we have three grantees yep. with us today who will be speaking at the end um, and are really the star, you know, the most important speakers of the day. Um, Abby, do you want to introduce Sure, her? yeah, so I'm Abby Willard. I'm the director of the Ag Development Division at the Agency of Agriculture. So the Working Lands Program is nested within the Agricultural Development Division of the Agency of Agriculture. And I'm here to help do run of show with Deputy Secretary Eastman as needed. Yeah. And then on the screen right now, um, I'm going to be introducing Diana later, but we have a colleague, Christina, Christina Sweet, from the Agency of Agriculture. and. Um, Bob, who is a board member, who will not be speaking today. Nobody on the screen will be speaking today, except for Allison. Yeah. Thank you. 
So appreciate that. If we omit introducing somebody, it's likely because of the capacity limit. So um, our apologies in advance, but we'll try to make sure that you get to know the who's who uh, sitting outside of your committee room as well. So uh, thank you all. As, as you're aware, 2022 uh, marked 10 years of the Working Lands Enterprise Initiatives, Vermont's Working Lands. In 2012, legislators passed Act 142, allowing the creation of the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative, a public-private partnership empowered with a broad range of levers to invest in the economy, environment, and culture of Vermont's working lands. Legislators in 2012 had the foresight to understand why a program like Working Lands Enterprise Fund needed to be created. Working Lands Enterprise Initiative has been a central resource for many of Vermont's working lands businesses, and moving forward, WELAD will be a critical resource as Vermont responds to challenges such as climate change, food insecurity, and global market pressures. Program readiness for fiscal year 2022 recommended uh, appropriation. I'm now going to turn it over to Elizabeth Sippel, our program lead for the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. That's me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good morning. I, yeah, I'm so honored really to be leading the Working Lands Initiative, um, a program that is benefiting so many working lands businesses um, and the communities that they serve. Um, I want to recognize my colleagues from the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, Diana Ferguson and Claire Salerno, who is outside the door, um, who work day in and day out to support the board's work and nimbly get dollars to working lands businesses and service providers. Um, I think I'm also really lucky to be working with um, Paul Fredericks and Catherine Servideo from Forest Parks and Recreation and with Rendell Scotts from Commerce and Community Development. Um, and I think that's a unique part of this program, the interwoven, which you'll see today, uh, how many different entities, agencies, and sector, um, industry sector experts are involved in making the Working Lands Program um, tick. Um, we are, the Working Lands Program is uniquely committed to being a very accessible grant making program. Um, we are engaged on keeping the application process as clear as possible. And we also accompany um, applicants through the entire navigation process on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, we work whenever possible to connect applicants to additional resources, whether that be business advising resources or additional funding opportunities. Um, and we also, to advance learning, offer individualized um, constructive feedback to unsuccessful applicants, um, which is quite unique. Um, today, what you are hearing today is evidence of what the Working Lands Enterprise Board does best, which is deploy capital and business assistance to farm, food, and forest enterprises. Um, they create new jobs, they protect jobs, they generate revenue for the state, and they also keep our working landscape vital and vibrant. Um, to date, grantees have created over 500 um, new jobs. They have also generated over $55 million in revenue in the two years following the completion of their grant. And they also steward uh, more than 24,000 um, working acres, or acres of working land. Um, and the board also um, works strategically. The board strategically allocates the appropriated funds and then measures the impact of those funds. And that is ultimately what we're excited to be sharing with you today. That's in this board. And that is also in the book. So we're going to be talking about that today, and it's also in this impact report, which captures 10 years of impact. Um, that's great. 
Are there any questions at this point? No. no. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I think now we'll invite in our first speaker, our first witness, or second witness, I guess. You're going to open us? Um, yeah, I think so. Yeah, they will sit right at the table. Do you want to introduce yeah, now, now we're going to invite in our fearless vice chair, Charlie Hancock of Northwood Forestry. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Allison. Um, so for the record, my name is Charlie Hancock. I'm a consulting forester based out of Montgomery, and I currently serve as the vice chair of the Working Lands Enterprise Board. It's good to see you all again. Yeah. Thanks for having us today. So um, as I said, I currently serve as the vice chair of the board. Uh, most of the work of the board is around governance. Um, the coordinating committee of the board facilitates planning and analysis that supports effective and efficient board decision making, which in turn amplifies our impact. Each year, the board gathers at an annual symposium to look at the landscape, both figuratively and literally, to determine the areas of greatest need and the greatest potential impact of limited dollars that we have to make. The thought partnership between practitioners, policymakers, funders, and individuals from across the working land spectrum has catalyzed significant program changes over the years, which have continued to really rise to the moment. And that's really the key of what the board does. Looks at the landscape and says, what does Vermont need from us now at this time? As you'll hear later, these uh, changes have included things like strategic investments in low-grade wood markets, developing supply chain and market level impact grant categories, and acknowledging the impacts required here and in specific areas such as that are really needed at a uniquely large scale. You know, we have large problems that are gonna need large investments. The grants review process brings together individuals beyond just the board <laughs> itself, from both the public and the private sector, all deeply rooted in this work who make investment recommendations that proactively address WeLab's strategic considerations and opportunities, enabling the initiative to be both innovative and responsive. I can't say enough about the teams that come together annually to do this work. Not only the depth of their knowledge around the table and the thoughtfulness of the deliberation, but the clear commitment to the success of Working Lands businesses, which often has a signing into conversations which go beyond the grant dollars at play, to really how we love can build better support networks and get enterprises the tools that they need for success. In 2012, the Working Lands Enterprise Board, or since 2012, the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative has invested $13.6 million in grants and contracts to 418 farm, food, and forestry businesses and to the service provider organizations who directly support these businesses. These investments have leveraged another $22.5 million in matching funds. So for every $1 in grant funds invested, another $1.6 in matching funds have been brought in to support these projects. As Elizabeth pointed out, over 500 new jobs have been created with grant funding supporting over an additional 1,100 jobs. We've impacted over 24,000 acres of our working landscape, and businesses can attribute more than 55 million in annual sales because of these grant-supported projects. These investments continue to make an impact in all 14 counties, and there's a really great map in the impact report that shows at county level where the impacts are being made. Um, these investments are designed to support businesses at critical stages of growth, the specific focus is on maintaining an active, working, and vibrant landscape, the foundation of Vermont's rural communities and economies. As you'll hear later, the impact or the need is great and it's growing. Each cycle, we see a request for public support outpacing funding by four to five times. In, 22, in 2022 alone, our business grant round received 130 applications requesting nearly $10 million in funding, and the program was only able to make 55 awards, totaling $4.3 million. WeLab is an established program. It has a competitive application process and a vetted review process with a track record of success. We can deploy more funds if you give it to us. So thank you very much for the time. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Commissioner Danny Fitzko from yeah. FPR. Questions for Charlie? Yes. Uh, if you were referring to the map on page eight, I'm just yes. curious how Essex County got zero money last year. And so like Caledonia got almost 900,000. Is there a rhyme or reason to that distribution and why it's so varied. Yeah, so um, so the every year the grants applications come in from different counties at different levels. Sometimes we get more from one county, less from another. Um, and so it's really kind of what we get in the door that we're able to react to and then deploy. Um, I will say that through the grant review process, we do make a deliberate, deliberate effort to think about 
how we're allocating the do dollars equi equitably across the state, and also thinking about kind of track records for counties that might have been underserved in the past. So for example, this past round, we thought about you know, Lamoille County and how they'd been represented in the past, um, or Caledonia County. So we do make a deliberate effort to kind of deploy funds equitably, but it all depends on what comes in the door. So Essex may have received money there before. Yes. Or on page six, there's a cumulative funding ah, map. Okay. Thank you. So the page eight is 2022 funds, but this Thank is you. here. Oh, this is great. like <clears throat> okay. cumulative funding per county. But you'll still see, there's you know, tracks, inequities. Right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. I think too, it's important to notice that some of the grants that we do uh, provide are upwards of 250 thousand. So you could have one grant in a county of 250,000 and 10 grants in another county that, you know, in the other counties that are small, 20, 50,000. So just keep that in mind. Um, thank you. So the matching one, you said one to 1. 1.6, I think those are federal funds, I assume. Um, so the funds that get matched come from the businesses themselves, uh, cash investments, they come from uh, debt equity in the businesses, they come from other grants, state, federal, nonprofit. Okay. So it's a variety of funds that are being drawn in. Yep. And I was impressed, Elizabeth mentioned that if you don't receive a grant that you s still stay in touch and say, hey, by the way, sorry we couldn't help. Have you had people come back a year later and been successful? Yes. Yeah. Okay. As I said, you know, the deliberation uh, process for uh, grant review and selection is, is both, you know, about dollars and cents. How do we deploy it? But it's also looking at these businesses and saying at this stage of growth, what does this business need? Oftentimes it's business support services, it's business planning, it's financial literacy. Uh, so we often look at kind of, OK, maybe they're not ready now. How do we give them the tools to be ready? And then they come back the next year. Right. That's that's very common. I'd say I have not seen a grant cycle where we have not seen applicants from previous years show back up. And the great thing is when they show back up, they show back up stronger because yeah. of the resources that we've directed to them. Excellent. Thank you. Uh -huh. Brian. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Charlie. Do you guys do outreach to de to areas also? So, in terms of like, sure, grants will come in or applications will come in. But is there any outreach saying, hey, you know, it'd be great if we got an application from Essex from this area? Does that kind of thing happen? Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that we proactively, at least in my experience, kind of say up front, hey, we should really kind of do some digging in Essex. Okay. But one thing that we do rely on is the networks across the state that we have okay. through the ag community, through the forestry community. Um, the, the you know the working with the enterprise board is a is a small group of people, but the entity itself reaches across Vermont with I'd say hundreds of people involved in like the greater family that are talking to folks on the ground that might not have the the capacity or the time or the knowledge to, to know this program exists. But yeah. for example, when a county forester meets with a firewood processor and says, "Hey, did you know about this program?" Right. Um, we've got consulting foresters on the ground. We've got folks from Agency of Ag working with farmers to kind of direct them to. To how um, how the pro a program could best support their needs. Thanks. Great. And could you tell us some anything about one particular uh, applicant that got the money and how it went? Yeah. So I'm actually psyched that Levi is here today from <laughs> Richford Natural Wood Products. Yeah. Um, she has a phenomenal story to tell that isn't just about you know one enterprise. Um, making some infrastructure investments and then producing a product. She's got a story to tell about a community, which I think is so important because so much of the work we do, it's not just about this one business. It's really about lifting up a community of people around that business and the community itself. And in certain instances, Great. like with Levi's story, where you can kind of see these successes and hold them up, it really just kind of catalyzes enthusiasm, effort, and engagement in a, in a broader community of people. And that's really the, the, the outcome so, we want. If you had a like someone with a, a sawmill, and there was one or two people working, and if they could add to that sawmill a couple more employees to put out more lumber and air dry it or something, because like lumber now is so expensive, uh, this West Coast and Canadian stuff. Yep. So is there any of those? Uh, oh yeah. We've got um, we've got an applicant we're working with just south of my, just south of me in Fletcher Laughingstock Farms Tucker Riggs. Um, they do a lot of custom sawing uh, for local markets, a lot of timber frame work, um, and they, they treat their their yard in a way like a like a like a lot on a log yard, like a, um, a, a a timber yard you'd see you know um, 
you know, sticks and stuff and things like that, where people come in and they'll toss a few two by fours on the roof and take off for a certain project. So it's different scales. Um, but yeah, we're seeing projects like that where certain infrastructure investments can allow them to bring on more, more employees. That's one of the metrics that we really use is kind of how are we impacting employment, moving from part-time to full-time, adding full-time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. And all of the grantees that speak today, you'll hear that their project is impacting more than their individual business. Yep. So you will hear more of those examples. Okay. Yeah, and it's responding to needs. The Salma one is a great example of how, you know, during COVID, we saw the demand for things, you know, skyrocket. And in yeah. a way, that was an opportunity for Laughing Stock Farms to ramp up production so that folks in Fletcher who wanted to build that deck didn't have to buy, you know, wood that's coming back from Canada. They can yeah. buy it from Fletcher. So. Yeah, we ship our logs up there, they sell them, and then bring the lumber back. And, yep. And yeah, well, that idea of keeping dollars local is, is phenomenal, and it's something that I'm sure you'll hear from the folks here today. Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. Thank, Great. You. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Chair, we have one of our speakers that needs to be in another room at 945. So the next two speakers, if we could hold questions, that would be fabulous just to get them to their next room on time. Where are you, where are you going at 945? Uh, one of our speakers that's coming in next into your room needs to be in another room at 945. Yeah. Um, so if we could hold questions and get through to our grant recipients, that would be amazing. And then we'll take questions. Yeah, very good. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Danielle Fitzko. I'm currently serving as the interim commissioner for the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. Oh, yeah. Nice to meet you. Thank you for having the team here today and to share the really the amazing work of the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. I get to highlight for you today some of the 2002 impacts of the grants. In 2002, we had historic investments in the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative. Special appropriations from the legislature increased the grant making from around $600,000 to an unprecedented $5.3 million, and it's making a huge impact across Vermont. What I've, one of the things I really love about the Working Land Enterprise Initiative is that they really know how to make strategic and smart investments, and they really know how to get the money out the door, which I can't say that's across the board. <laughs> uh, these funds were used to target bottlenecks in the local meat supply chain, which resulted in $1.1 million in grants out to support meat production and processing businesses. We also leveraged the special funds to make transformational large-scale investments up to $250,000, which is huge uh, for these industries. These initiatives resulted in supply chain and market level impacts. Uh, these much needed larger grants supports businesses in forestry and in value added agriculture, which projects create opportunities for multiple businesses across the supply chain. I'm going to give you an example of a project from last year. Farm Context, which is at the Center for Agriculture, Economy, and Hardwick, delivers $12 million in food to from 100 of Vermont producers across the state that are too small or too rural to actually connect up with traditional delivery firms. Uh, I love their slogan, we go where you grow. Um, <laughs> Their bottleneck, like it's good, it. right? Yeah, it's very good. Uh, their bottleneck was their space, 1,200 square feet. They received nearly $250,000 in the impacts grants to really scale up that biz business and grow their infrastructure. The investment will now allow farm complex to support more small farms to get food from the farm to shelves and connecting more Vermonters with fresh local food. The costs needed to make real impacts in the forestry sector are high. It's just the nature of the industry. Um, and forest-based businesses uh, this year had a historic investment of $1.4 million. Forest-based businesses uh, help keep Vermont's forest forested, which 75% of the state is forested. These businesses actually help to conserve forests across the state. Uh, I am excited today that you're going to meet two forestry grant recipients. We have Ethan Jevry from Jevry Firewood and Levi Irish from Vermont National Forest Products. So you'll get to hear directly from grant recipients. Also in 2022, the initiative prioritized 
funding for service provider organizations. The board recognizes that to make historic investments, businesses need to be ready and they need to be supported. Um, investments went to support business vitality and organizational and governance uh, for producer associations. There were 11 farm, forest, and value-added food associations that received awards this past year. One recipient was Vermont Woodlands Association, an organization supporting private forest landowners in Vermont. If we look at our forested landscape, 80% is in private land ownership. And if you're thinking about forest businesses, that connection to private landowners is just crucial. $10,000 grant went to Vermont Woodlands Association to really support a robust strategic planning initiative, uh, which was for succession planning for their executive director retired this past year. You, some of you probably know Kathleen Warner, who retired. This, this investment allowed them to strategically plan for that transition, and it resulted in an increase in both membership and donor support of 10%. The $5.3 million awarded in 2022 leveraged $11.3 million in matching funds. Um, and the investment that the working lands invest, investment of the working lands is about Vermont's culture, our community, our economy, and our environment, and for Vermont for the future. That's my roundup for 2022 grants, and I'm due to pass it to Kate Brooks next. Thank you. <clears throat> Any questions? For oh, I should have waited. As commissioner, we have to have a question. <laughs> <laughs> we know they're on a schedule, so. You're enjoying the job. I'm enjoying the job, and I'm happy to come back and talk to you anytime. Okay. Thanks, Thank, you. Thank you very much. Pretty bad when you have to take turns out in the hallway, huh? <laughs> it's a beautiful hallway, Senator. <laughs> it was, it was. Maybe, maybe a little oh. additional artwork would help. We were going to lend these photos. Uh, ah, yeah. exactly. We got the artwork in here. It's beautiful. Uh, welcome. Uh, Welcome, thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, for the record, I'm Tate Brooks. I'm the Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, the Working Lands Board <coughs> has uh, designees for the Secretary of Commerce. Uh, so I serve as uh, Secretary Curley's uh, designee. Uh, again, the Commissioner, of, uh, Secretary of Ag and the Commissioner of Forest and Parks. And so, uh, you know, it was great catching up with uh, Secretary Curley about a year and a half ago and talking about my interest in serving on the board, just for background, um, I grew up on a seventh generation dairy farm up in Franklin County. So certainly could understand the value and see the importance of uh, the working lands uh, and the importance to, uh, to, to rural Vermont. <clears throat> so with that, just have a, a, a few remarks I wanted to share with, uh, with the committee this morning. Uh, Vermont's, uh, Vermont's food, farm, forest, and wood product sector are critical uh, economic engine for the state and especially crucial for rural Vermont. Uh, these grants encourage innovation and risk-taking to bring these companies to the next phase. Uh, the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative is unique because it invests in the businesses and organizations that are the keystone to support our working lands economy. The Vermont Working Lands Enterprise uh, entrepreneurs are the heart of our rural communities. They are the backbone of the Vermont economy and are certainly critical to the $3 billion tourism industry. And they're certainly a very important source for rural job creation and an integral part to what continues to make Vermont a quality place to live. So thank you. For sure. <laughs> so uh, one question, if like people get these small, well, some big grants, but mostly, you know, small grants. Do, does that put them eventually, have you seen any, now we've been at this 10 years, going to ACCD for larger grants, Steve, and grow, grow bigger? Yeah, there that? certainly certainly uh, have been some, uh, some examples over the 10 years where, again, Working Lands kind of uh, offers up some additional smaller dollars to kind of jumpstart things, without a doubt, yes. Yeah, so. and, and it's great, again, a lot of credit to uh, 
to the legislators, uh, and I know Senator Starr, you played an important part on this uh, years ago, uh, to include the Agency of Commerce as well, uh, because wow. the agricultural sector is... <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's good to have that cross-agency, uh, cross-department uh, pollinization, and, and this board certainly uh, accomplishes that. Yeah. Well, any, uh, anything else? Or Sounds like it's good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Ellen Taylor, our executive director of Vermont Sustainable uh, Jobs Fund. Seems like we've seen her before. <laughs> I'll keep it very short, Senator, but no. please say your name no for the record. Way. <laughs> <laughs> Ellen Kaler, Vermont Sustainable Welcome. Jobs Fund. Great to be with you again. Um, so uh, my job is to give you a, a quick overview of the ex officio seats. Um, as you may know, of the 20 members on the board, three of them are ex officio. Uh, the Sustainable Jobs Fund Executive Director, the Director of uh, Vermont Housing Conservation Board, and also somebody from VITA, a designee from VITA. And so Gus Selig and Sarah Isham and I are all ex officio members. It means that we do not actually vote on any of the grant applications. We can we help with review, we help with background information. And the reason that you all did that when you passed the bill, the, the, the bill uh, in 2012 is because you recognized that this program was something that was going to survive administrations. And there was going to be people rotating on and off the board. There were going to be administration staff off and on the board. So this was an opportunity to have some both subject matter expertise on the board, um, but also somebody that could hold that historical knowledge of what we've done over the years. So that's a big part. And also, and my position was, was added because of the Farm to Plate Investment Program to, to provide both some of that ag sector-based knowledge, but also we do forest products work. And so that also um, is something I bring to the board. Um, the, the board is empowered to, by statute, to, uh, to uh, prioritize what it will be taking, the funding that we get in the, after a given uh, fiscal year then we're, we're tasked with figuring out how best to put it out into the world. Uh, and so we get together as a board for a retreat every year where we take a look at, we hear from different uh, constituents, from different subject matter experts, we figure out what is the need for the year ahead, and then we say, okay, let's put this amount in service provider grants, this amount in the business grants, this amount in the larger, oh, let's have you know, uh, up to 75,000 this year because we didn't get a big allocation from, the, from the, the state, but this year we have a bigger allocation, so we'll go up to 250. So like we, we, we sort all that out and then that is what then the staff goes forward with putting out in terms of RFPs and managing that whole process. But it's the board that sets what those programs are and the, and the dollar amounts per year, okay? Um, and so one of the big things just for, to take away and remember um, about is, uh, this is a very popular program as you know, and we're always oversubscribed. Meaning, there's always more requests than we have funding for. Um, and just as a point of reference, in fiscal year 22, we had close to $5.3 million that we were able to put out. And a lot of that was because of pandemic era uh, uh, ARPA funds and others um, funding. Um, and we had 11 million in requests. So we put out 5.3, we had 11 in requests from 181 applicants. Now, not all those applicants are always ready to go. But one of the things that, that is what I've seen over the last 10 years is that the oscillation of, of the year over year, how much of an allocation we get impacts what we can do. And it impacts uh, the, the calculus of various businesses about when they might apply. So if you think about somebody that wants to do an expansion project, they wanna, they wanna add on capacity and add, add jobs or they wanna um, uh, change out some equipment or something like that. You think about it, you know that there's always a bank available to you, right? You can always go, to, the bank has always got money. But if you need some grant funds to, because you don't have enough equity and you're gonna go to Vita and get a loan at the normal 80-20 loan to value ratio, you've gotta have 20% of equity, right? That you wanna be able to cash you wanna put in. This money, we love money, counts like equity. It, it serves the role like equity, as if the owner, it was their cash, right? Well, it is, exactly. So, so when you think about it, if we go from fiscal 21, where we had about 600,000 to work with in grants, 
Then we went in fiscal 22, we had 5.3 million that we gave out. And then in fiscal 23, currently, we're gonna be giving out 2.1 million. And if the governor's recommended uh, budget goes forward uh, with you all, next year, fiscal 24, we will have about 5 million. So we have, the governor put forward 4 million, and then we have a million left over from last year's extra last minute money that you guys provided. So we'll have five million next year. So, but think about it in terms of like, if you're a business owner and you're trying to plan for when you want to expand, you, you're like, well, should I go this year? Should I wait? Is there gonna be money enough next year? You know, and, and so from a business perspective and planning out, when is the best time for my business to be applying? Knowing that there's this steady, a steady level in WeLab um, is very helpful. So that's all I wanted to, to let you know about. It's a great program. As you all know, we so appreciate your support over the years. And uh, well, pass it on. Well, it's gone pretty well. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So <clears throat> those of us in the legislature, whether we like it or not, are always at meetings. That's what we do. It just meeting after meeting after meeting. How many times does the board meet? The, meet, the board meets monthly. Okay. Sometimes we get a month off in the summer, depending on how busy a year it is. Um, but uh, during the summer months is when we do our planning for the year ahead, because basically by September, the staff has to be putting out the RFPs or getting them ready to go out. So uh, we spend July, August usually having a, a, a retreat to figure out what we're going to do for the coming year. And then it's a steady stream. You can get the, the detail, the gory details from Elizabeth on all the review meetings and how we do the yeah. process. So, Have yeah. you ever talked about a way to set up for a steady stream of money year after year that we could do to make it more uh, steady so you could plan from one year to the next? I know VHCB had a uh, funding stream and we even took, you know, some of that away back a while ago, and it's up here, and it's down here, and, and so you got a view of the board, and uh, well, the, no, I mean the board, we're not we're not supposed to be advocating for things because <laughs> we're just administering the program. The Working Lands Coalition that Vermont. Council on Rural Development supports, you know, they have been pushing for many, many years to get up to at least five million in base. Yeah. So that's a... What, what's your base now? Uh, a million. Uh, be good to pump that up. Yeah. So. Uh, any other questions for him? Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Yeah, I told you it'd be short. <laughs> <laughs> you did well. Thank you. Next up is Gus Seelig, Executive Director of the Salon County Contribution Board. And the base that increased to a million this year, FY23. It was 594000 Last year. Yep. Yep. Good morning, Gus. Good morning. Pleasure to be with you. Good morning. I'm going to try to be uh, really brief today because there are people more important for you to hear from than me. Um, but for the record, Gus Seelig, Director for the Vermont. Housing and Conservation Board. Um, I am usually sitting here talking to you about our programs, um, and today I'll talk a little bit about our programs as they relate to the Working Lands Initiative. Um, so as you all know, we uh, uh, have bought land in fee for recreation, for wildlife habitat, for conserve our, we buy development rights for farmers regularly. And about 20 years ago, um, <coughs> We went off to a conference in Maine and learned about how they were doing business planning and technical assistance for uh, the ag community. Uh, they had a farm viability program. And we brought that idea back to Vermont, and the governor at that time asked us to get that going. And uh, so this committee actually established uh, the Vermont Farm and now Forest Viability Program. There's a statute for it. The Massachusetts program had always had a portion of it that when you completed a business plan, you would get a grant at the end of it to help implement your business plan. Mm -hmm. But we hit a point where state revenues got really tight, and so we were only able to do the business planning part of that work. So I was really pleased having been on a ton of community visits with Paul Costello when he came up with the idea that there ought to be this kind of program. He actually asked if we take it on, and I said, 
it, this needs its own life. And I served on the board the first three or four years, uh, and then had Ella Chapin represent us. Ella has just talked about the role of ex officios, and I've come back to the board this year. And what I want to say to you is, I'm a wholehearted supporter of this initiative, that um, we know that it takes more than a good plan, it takes more than buying development rights for our rural landscape to be vibrant, um, that I think this is a program that addresses some of the concerns that Senator Westman mentioned when we were here, we're working with lots of small entrepreneurs getting started um, or trying to grow their businesses to the next place, and so we are very happy that this program has caught fire coming back to the board. It, it is a much more sophisticated operation today under Elizabeth's leadership uh, than it was when we were inventing it back 10 years ago. Um, and I think you'll see that in the annual, annual report. And really, rather than me spending much more time talking today, I want to stop talking. I'll answer any questions you have. But I think you've got three witnesses uh, today to tell you about their businesses, and that's the most important part of the story to be told. Yeah. Well, um, and we, we have you in usually the I will say there is a lot of back and forth between the viability program and the working lands program, so sometimes people are not successful in getting a grant and they get referred to our program, which has now touched 900 businesses to help them get ready. Um, sometimes there's follow-up for a successful enterprise through the Rural Economic Development Initiative. So last year, we helped five different farmers win value-added producer grants from USDA. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth um, between our programs, a lot of mutual support, um, and, th and this is a great extension of what we all need to do to have a vibrant rural economy. Well, <clears throat> what, you know, what I am hearing today and like and liking is that you all work together and, you know, you may not even work on one deal, but six months later or a month later you're in on uh, working uh, you know with the group and you know working together you can accomplish a lot and working independently you never know so you know that's a good a good sign yep, yep. thank you Gus uh, thank you for coming in thank you thank to see you thank you all thank you very much Thank you, Gus. One more speaker before we get to uh, the three most important. Uh, Sarah Isham, Director of Agricultural Lending and at Vermont Economic Development Authority. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Fine. How are you? Good. Good to see you. Thanks for having us in here. Yeah. Welcome. Thanks. So the Vermont Economic Development Authority is an ex officio member of WeLab, which is allowed for partnering and leveraging um, opportunities. And VITA's role in providing financing to farm and forest-based businesses to enhance Vermont's economy has allowed WeLab and VITA to work together collaboratively to provide financing options. By consistently providing grants to businesses, WeLab complements the day-to-day -day work of Vermont lenders and capital providers. From time to time, WeLab has demographically supported financing institutions to provide innovative financing tools that effectively leverage public dollars to address system gaps and opportunities. Thank you. Shall I move now? No, that was yeah. great. Sarah, do, do you ever get applications later on, let's say a few years after people have started with a working lanes grant and they want to expand? Do yes. Do you, you see applications coming in from some of the same people? Oh, yeah, yes. To grow and yes, it's very common that we do applications um, for. Um, businesses that get working lands grants, sometimes it's at the same time, and it like it's kind of a partnership. And then um, sometimes one or the other of us would have been in there before the other. 
And so it's always a nice success story to, uh, you know, to see it from both sides. Yeah. Brian, and how long have you been working in this area? Uh, about 27 years. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. That's yep. Great. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, much. Mr. Chair. So, just ballpark figure, what's the average uh, amount that someone might borrow? The average is around 100000 Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. We make, uh, many of our loans are to small to medium-sized businesses. Yep. Yeah. And then we can go up in excess of a million, but, um, you know, that's less common. So on the small side, that's good to know. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's yep. really to fill gaps in financing. Yeah. So it works well. You can buy a set of tires. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And some lumber. Yeah. We don't know tires right now. Pretty expensive. Yeah. Thank, uh, you. Thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was nice to see you. Thank you, Sarah. Next up, uh, Jennifer record show. I am Brian Leach, uh, owner and operator of Haystack Farmstead in Paulette. Oh. So, good to see you, Senator. Same here. You must oh. be uh, uh, the son of a friend of Perry Waits. I sure am, yeah. And uh, our thoughts are with Perry's family. Yeah. He just recently lost his wife, so, uh, yeah. We were, Perry and I were big buddies and spent a lot of time up here. Yep. Perry was all Sunday night, it was kind of sad news. Yeah, yeah, certainly. When I chaired House Appropriations, Perry was on the So thank you for having me. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as I mentioned, owner-operator of Haystack Farmstead. I um, am a seventh generation farmer raised on a dairy went to school for mechanical engineering at the University of Vermont, worked in the field of, of renewable energy for a few years before coming back to the dairy and co-managing it with my father and brother from 2012 to 2019. Um, during that time, my wife Brea and I were working on setting up Haystack Farmstead, which is a was located on a satellite cropping farm that my parents had purchased in the 80s that had some unused but maintained upland pasture that seemed like a good fit for starting a diversified enterprise. So we leased that property from my parents for close to 10 years and were finally able to purchase it. We closed on it over the spring of last year. Um, so that's progress for us as a family. Thank you. Great. Um, as an enterprise, Haystack Farmstead uh, generates sales through um, the sale of grass-fed beef, but throughout the years I've always heavily supplemented my on-farm on income with engineering work, and I equipped a, a shop facility at the farm to be able to do fabrication and repair services. I've even gone as far as Malta, New York to work as a uh, semiconductor process tech in the Global Foundries Chip Fab in Malta um, to just make ends meet, pay the bills, that proved to be a little too much of a grind. That was two and a half hours of commuting each day. Um, Isn't that round trip, yeah, oh over that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, wow. and that's just been my story, and I'm not, a, I know I'm not alone in small scale agriculture, just, you know, doing what I can to try to make ends meet. But as an engineer and farmer, uh, my career goal has always been to develop uh, intelligent and small scale solutions to help farmers um, develop and evolve and to focus on adding more value on farm. And so one such system is what I call the, referred to as a modular meat plan, and this is something that I've been working on for several years now. I can pass around just a, this is a cross section of the facility as designed that is currently under construction with the help of uh, working lands. Uh, we were able to secure a, a working lands grant to contribute to help us construct this facility. Um, so this type of system is um, designed to provide small scale, affordable, yet uh, efficient and functional uh, processing capabilities for farmers that want to add value on their farms. Now small scale, are you talking about 
animal numbers or a size of the animal? Well, it's, I mean, it's a loosely defined term. So the farm that we operate is, I would like to think that it's kind of a typical Vermont dairy farm, 350 acres of a mix of cropland, pasture, and, and woodlands, managed woodlands. Um, and so on that farm, we are able to, you know, through the years, we've been able to produce 30 to 40 finished beef per year, which isn't a lot because we're, we're a cow-cow-calf cow operation, which means we generate our own replacements, and so we have to carry pregnant cows through the winter. And that, you know, that is, that's a challenge in itself. Um, so the aim of this particular facility is to provide that small-scale processing capability, um, but also there's some, there's some unique things about the way it's being built. Um, I've tried to focus on incorporating as many locally sourced um, materials as possible. Uh, this has been a really interesting pilot project where we sourced um, we sourced a load of beautiful hemlock from a local logger and, and milled it all on farm and incorporated it into these modular build sections. So it's just an illustration of some of the creative things we can do and we really focus on valuing our working landscape. Um, but another really interesting facet about this project is it's not just our farm, it's not just Haystack Farm said. So this is a collaboration. We've got two other livestock farmers from Paulet. To my knowledge, there's something like eight, I think there's eight farmers in Paulet alone that are marketing uh, animal proteins as part, of their, uh, as part of their business. So it just gives you an idea of how much potential there is in Vermont, our small towns have so much potential to um, to provide the state's protein needs. Well, I think the guy on the farmer on Perry White bought Perry White's farm. He's doing beef. He is. I mean, my Some brother, beef. my brother's doing beef. My my cousin's doing beef. I mean, it's people are, you know, we've seen just the the, the challenges in dairy have forced farmers to think about what else can we do, and that's why I went down this path and in, in 2012. Um, and just as far as the working lands impact um, on this project, you can see here that, you know, this is a pretty ambitious, there's, um, it's, I'd like to think that it's kind of forward reaching um, some of the elements of this project. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of facets to it that are difficult to financially justify when we're talking about financing this with conventional approaches. Um, so just being able to, to finance a smaller portion of this build is a really big deal and working lands has helped um, help me make this possible. Uh, we've also had support from uh, Northeast Sustainable Ag um, Research and Education, and you say are based out of UVM, and we've also had some support from Vermont Land Trust for this as well. Um, and so, I mean, I, another example of, of why the, the help from working lands is so needed is because uh, while I believe that there's a future for livestock farming in Vermont on this scale, the current climate for it is really challenging. I mean, it's not like we've had an easy go of this since we started. Um, Vermonters are on a tight budget, at least in our in our corner of the state. Um, working, you know, working everyday working Vermonters really struggle with every part of their household budget, and food is and food is part of that as well. And so there's a long way to go, just in in terms of what we have to accomplish with marketing opportunities and good policy to make something like this work. This right now, I'm just focusing on. This is a particular. This is a. This is a. This is a tool. This facility is a tool. It's means of production for a farm, so yeah. that needs to exist within a healthy framework for farming as well. But that's beyond the scope of what I'm trying at now, right now. Your neighbor farmers, is this has this been built? It's, it's under construction right now. This is an active grant. So you'll be able to take care of your own animals plus mm -hmm. seven or eight maybe more? Or? Well, it just depends. On, it, there's, there's flexibility, but under with our current working model, uh, the two other farmers that, I, that I'm working with, we will be uh, slaughtering livestock in this facility. Uh, we'd be working as a, as a team, as a unit on those days when the, a lot of hands are needed. Uh, that will happen once or twice a month. And then throughout the rest of the month, farm, the individuals will be coming in and doing their own packaging, processing, that sort of thing. And will you be able to do small animals like goats and lamb? Yeah, that's actually quite a bit easier. If you look at this facility, you can see it's, um, it has to be double height because in order to process cattle, you need a lot of ceiling height. So actually, um, facilities that were uh, specifically designed for small ruminants would actually be quite a bit uh, easier to build and lower cost. 
So as far as our, this project's impact on our business and other businesses, um, the desire to, to add value just comes from the fact that uh, at processing and packaging meat uh, adds over 50% of the perceived value of the packaged protein product. Um, and it's a natural desire to want to bring that activity to the farm when we're talking about viability of small scale farming. So, in general, we want to be part of the trend of Vermont farmers that are adding more value, not volume. We want to create, we want to create more space for other farmers knowing that there are other people just like us that are out there trying to make this work. And in addition to that, we've got immediate direct impact. As I mentioned, this is uh, over 90% 90, 90 of the materials budget so far on this project has been spent in town. And so we're very proud of that. And, um, and then obviously uh, thriving farms in our small towns is just good for the local economy. You know, farmers would spend, would gladly spend some money to replace windows in their old farmhouses or, you know, buy takeout at the general store. I mean, it, it, that's just, and then, so it's sort of at a higher level, um, our impact to other farmers is that this facility once complete and the working model, it's we are going to encourage other farmers that are interested in making this transition. This will be a place where they can come and train uh, to learn more. Uh, as you can see, the design is it's the design is being shared. It's being web hosted. It's what we call an open source uh, project, and that all the blueprints are available to other farmers. So. It's unlikely that people are going to want to duplicate this exactly, but there's so many other lessons learned through this project that uh, other farmers that are interested in this can benefit from. Did you design yeah. it, Mark? Yes. Oh, yep. you did? Oh, yep. great. Oh, that's, uh, that's great that, you know, in a different area, they may want to duplicate the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I actually, so the, this design is posted on uh, SARE's website, which is just this database for farmers that are interested in sustainable ag and I got an inquiry from someone in Washington State who was like hey what's the deal with this you know can you build one and send one and <laughs> yeah <laughs> really <laughs> yeah so I we're I'd not gonna be, get our habit ahead of ourselves I'd be interested to access that link and be able to send yeah. it to people because I can think of people that would be interested yeah absolutely we can get you that link and there's there's quite a bit more detail yeah, there's a detailed a, design report there for, for, okay yeah <laughs> right so as far as hopes and dreams going forward, um, and, you know, we really just want to support our, I think like many farmers, we would really just like to have a simple, uh, less stressful living. We just want to support our families and have some of these missing pieces in place for the next generation. I mean, I, like I mentioned, I've always been doing this or that, fixing someone's car, driving to Malta. I will continue to have to do this off and on, and that's just that's the story of our generation. But I think that we can, if we build towards the future, we can be serious about making sure that like my my children, if they want to, can earn a living on that farm. Wouldn't that be something? Um, that's what my daddy told me. Yeah. Didn't your dad tell you? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's painful for my father's generation, I think, to see what's you know. So my brother currently runs the the family dairy and does a terrific job with it. But it's just, these are just trying times to be in the space. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just state the obvious that the Working Lands Enterprise Initiative is is the program that's best positioned to intelligently and strategically support. Uh, work like this uh, to build a future for Vermont agriculture that we're really proud of. And uh, I'm beyond thankful to have support and the opportunity to, to, to work on this project. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Would, did you have any permitting issues as you went through with this? Community? Well, it's, on, it's, it's ongoing. Um, this particular facility, as it's designed, is actually not technically a, a permanent structure. It's, um, it's not actually anchored as a foundation because it's built in modular units. Um, but I, I think that in all likelihood, our farm is zoned for, zoned for agriculture. And so processing it on farm is, uh, is not gonna be an issue with that zoning. I think as you, as farmer, if farmers like me wanna do more uh, processing for hire, 
when that amount of activity exceeds exceeds the volume that we're doing on our farm, then it becomes a commercial facility, and then you know that you'd have to be seeking zoning yeah. approval for that yeah. for that activity. I'm just curious, Brian. The uh, two neighbor farms, do they help with the cost of this? And what about when they're bringing uh, animals in to be processed? Do that's, they pay you? That's a terrific question. And it, so the currently, as it's set up, we are we're going to be taking out a small loan um, to equip this facility. Uh, I believe it's, right now we've got it figured to around $30,000. It's pretty reasonable. Um, so right now the expectation with my collaborators is that once we're up and operating, their processing fees are basically going to go towards that payment and it's gonna be allocated by a percentage of usage, if that, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, good business sense, yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr. Chair. Sounds like a lot of sweat equity on your part already. What type of loan did you receive from working on this to get started? So it's interest. It was um, we received ninety-five thousand um, dollars through a meat and slaughter processing uh, business-specific carve-out. So I believe that working lands in this instance was acting as a conduit for federal funds that were coming out from uh, COVID-related uh, pro meat processing, yeah. Great. Yeah. Part of the special appropriations that were given to the program in FY22. Yeah. Yep. Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's good. But it's also, just to clarify, it's not a loan, it's a grant. Right, right. Yeah. Well, okay, okay. Yes. Good. thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No? That, uh, just one more, I know we're getting short on time, and I can't wait to hear from our other two. Um, the process, the grant application, yeah. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Is it is it something that you, I mean, I've been through a lot, not necessarily lately, but, you know, page after page after page after page. And I assume, yeah. we, since we have such a successful program going, that they make it as easy as they can to fill this out and move along? Yeah, and, and actually, you're, um, you asked the question earlier about uh, applicants that are denied and, yeah. you know, come back being better informed. I actually am, am an instance of that. So. Uh, the, the prior year I applied for um, I think the general round of, of business grants and was denied and I got feedback um, for the, you know the reasons why I was denied which I of course disagreed with because <laughs> <laughs> I'm the applicant right yeah, yeah. Um, but what they did say is uh, you know keep your eyes peeled because there could be these federal funds coming in specifically for meat processing and this might be a good fit for for that and so so then I applied for that subsequent round and, and was successful but as far as I mean I've been applying for working lands projects um, since 20 like since the beginning okay um, so this is the this is the first time that I've um, been able to put through a, a successful application but it's a pretty significant I mean you know we're talking a really significant amount of money so it's um, I think there's an understanding that you've got to put in the work uh, to do it, but I have noticed an improvement in the uh, procedural um, improvement through the years in terms of how easy it is to, to do the application, uh, the format, the working format, and That's all that. That's what I was yep. 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 Well, it takes a while to work for the bug sale, and, you know, to get things going. Yep. And the, the worst thing that anybody up here could do is put together a plan and have it flop. Mm -hmm. Because then you sort of lose your credibility. Certainly. And uh, so the Ag Committee up here has got a pretty good track record of putting together good, you know, solid programs. And yeah, you, you get rejected sometimes, uh, the applicants, but I mean, it's, it's based on <coughs> real sound. Ag, uh, you know, history, and and uh, and that's important to for the future. You know, when your children come along, you know, I said this is still going. Or like uh, Gus Celix, uh, yeah, the yeah. VHCB, and uh, yeah. you know the uh, the current use program and things like that. Basically, got put together and. In the ag committee, and and they, you know, I don't. We've never had a whopper, as I would call it. <laughs> uh, and uh, 
So, uh, you know, we all work hard to make it work. Uh, and it sounds like, I mean, you had to wait since the beginning to, to get a, uh, a grant, but it worked out for you. And uh, mm -hmm. hopefully other areas will, uh, you know, go from your idea and your plans to doing this. But, you know, we've got a big beef market not that many miles away that we should be supplying with good uh, locally grown wholesome meat. So, thanks uh, for... Thanks, thanks Brian. Nice job. I just want to point out these are the co-owners. <laughs> this is oh, yeah, yeah. 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 The future. Yeah. So, <coughs> Allison, and who's that? Right. Yeah. Next up is Ethan <coughs> Jeffrey of Jack Firewood. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ethan Jeffrey. I am a co owner of uh, Jeffrey Firewood as well as the owner and operator of Champlain Valley Farm in Addison. Mm -hmm. I'm a fifth generation farmer and a third generation firewood producer. Uh, Jeffrey Firewood is a family owned and operated firewood business in Addison, Vermont. We serve Rutland, Chittenden, and Addison counties as well as in years past the entire state of Vermont for the state parks. Mm -hmm. We also send firewood, uh, kiln dried firewood to Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and into New York City as well. My grant funded project was an expansion of my firewood business to allow me to be able to produce more wood to meet local and you know regional market demands. Um, we started this business in 2021 and 2020 when COVID and everything started we were doing it very very small scale and uh, using a firewood processor my grandfather had purchased years and years ago when he did firewood for 25 years before his passing and uh, during 2020 we just saw a huge huge demand with everybody home because of the pandemic and we saw more <clears throat> demand we were getting a lot more calls from other areas of the you know of the region you know including massachusetts and connecticut and we also noticed a very large draw for kiln dried wood so we went out, me and my father took money out of both of our existing businesses and went out and bought a brand new firewood processor, a kiln, um, some delivery trucks, and you know, started to grow our business. And we got to a point after we took on this initial, you know, initial project of our own of the, you know, that first stuff. Um, we were at a point where we turned to the Working Lands Board to help us grow to meet the next level of production that we were looking for that the market was calling for at that time. Um, so in, uh, before we applied for our Working Lands Grant, um, we, we had three employees total and we were purchasing about $180,000 worth of raw material from Vermont loggers in our first year of business. In 2022, once we had started our expansion project with the help of the Working Lands Fund, we were able to purchase around half a million dollars in logs from Vermont loggers last year. And we had five full-time employees and three part-time employees. Wow, that was good increase. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, more than double. Yeah, absolutely. It's a, you know, it's an ever growing market. And it's an ever changing market. You know, we, every time we, you know, we do something, we, you know, it, we look at five steps ahead of us and we're like, okay, well, we're going to have to switch this and this to, you know, make this how we want it and, you know, make the product better for people. Um, one thing we do is we ultra tumble our firewood. So our firewood gets screened three times before we deliver it. So what does that mean exactly? How, what do you so we have tumblers yep. uh, through the Help Working Lands. Yep. We got a couple tumblers 
And what they do is they the firewood comes off our processors and goes into these barrel style tumblers that spin okay. and it screens the bark, the debris, the you know, the splintery stuff yep. off. So we screen it prior to going into baskets to be dried. Yep. And then we load it in the kilns, dry it, and then we screen it again when it comes out. Great. Before it goes on delivery. So, so do you make mulch out of that bark or do you the, that yeah. we are in the process of moving in that direction. As you can see in my photo right there, that's my facility. Um, next to that hoop barn across from the other ones, you see that pile of material? That's a pile of bark. <laughs> uh, the, okay. yeah. the, 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 mulch, the mulch section of the business is almost another business in itself. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the, the machinery to make mulch is very, very, very expensive. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, that uh, looks really? like quite a pile. Well, in the bar, people don't really like that anyway. Some people know. like it, some people don't. If they request for kindling when they call and make their order, we take some of that dried kindling that came out of the kiln that we just screened out, put it in a bag for them, and just give it to them as a you know as a as a goodwill, you yeah. know, to go with their firewood order. Oh, that's nice. um, with our current sales and our projected sales and new markets we're working on, and uh, just being able to grow like we did with the help of the Working Lands Fund. Um, we're actually able to build a couple buildings this coming spring to allow us to store more, more pro dry product and more uh, split product. So we can have, you know, a thousand cords of dry wood going into October or going into September. And that'll better allow us to compete with larger firewood companies across the Northeast that have this storage. Um, versus us being able to just cut to order and dry to order. I mean, currently we have 18 cord of drying capacity a day. And there's times of the year where if I had four times that, I would still be weeks out. Hmm. Brian, thanks Mr. Chair. So that's incredible that you were able to hire, create 10 jobs. Was it hard finding those people? Just because, the, you know, right now we're hearing from everybody. It was. Thankfully, three of my, I've had three employees on my farm okay. since they were, they're my cousins. And they've worked for me ever since they were old enough to work. And the way I have my farm set up, you know, it's, I have, I raise pigs, so it's all automated. And uh, I was able to dedicate them so they could split their time okay. between the two. Yeah. As we grew though, we have experienced very, a lot of hardships hiring people and retaining employees yeah. just because of the production, you know, it's the, the repetition. That they don't like. It's the same thing yeah. every day. Yeah. You sit in a firewood processor and you cut wood yeah. for 10 hours. Um, we are actually looking at going to are incorporating some migrant labor into our workforce yeah. because that's what's available to us. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So you do some uh, farming as well as. Uh, I, I currently raise about 3,000 pigs a year. Oh, yeah. um, I supply Black River Produce with all their pork. Um, I also supply several other smaller markets. And uh, so I do the we do the pigs, and then we actually added the firewood as more of a uh, more of a family business. Me and my wife had a son in uh, 2020, and we decided if she was going to work for somebody, she might as well work for a family business. So that's kind of when we started digging into the firewood more and saw the need. Um, my wife actually runs firewood processor usually every day. <laughs> or she delivers wood or, or you know whatever whatever is needed um, our goals for the business are uh, to be at eight to ten thousand cords by 2025 and we're pretty confident that with what we've done with working lands and what um, you know we continue to do on our own as well as the help with Vermont Agricultural Credit Corporation and Vita who is we do all our work with um, that we'll be able to attain that goal pretty easily as long as we can source enough wood. At the end of the day, everything on the firewood business rides on the ability to get wood. 
Yeah, how is that? Uh, I mean, you're doing the woods a great service by getting that low grade wood out of yep. there. Is, do you have people in their area that, that that's their work or their All work? our, yeah, all, everything we buy comes from eight or nine loggers within 60 miles of our facility. Oh, wow. So they're doing bigger log jobs, but they're cleaning out as they go. Exactly. You know, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these loggers work for the, you know, contract cut for the A. Johnson Company or the United States U.S. Forest Service, um, you know, orders for private landowners. But we, uh, we have eight or nine core loggers we purchase from, and uh, we also own our own log trucks and go out and get wood from these loggers versus rather having them bring it in because the trucking is a huge bottleneck on the receiving of the product. Yeah. Yeah. So other questions? Yeah, no, it's great. So it's really equipment heavy I mean, in terms of cost. And yeah, absolutely. Me and, yeah, we, yeah, we invested half a million before we went to Working Lands, you know, to do the next yeah. step. And I mean, that half a million dollars got us to a point where, you know, we could have a good, we could sustain and have a very good operation at that point, but we were nowhere near even tapping into the current market that was available and what the need for that market was. I mean, I still know of, I mean, at this point, we're only about two and a half weeks out right now on firewood. Um, but there was a time, if you called me in November, I would have told you I'll see you in the end of January. And that's, you know, five, six days. That's five days a week of cutting, and our kilns run seven days a week. Yeah, wow. That's, uh, that's a long time to wait for heat. Yeah, it, it is. It is, unfortunately, yeah. We, we, we try not to keep anybody, you know, waiting that long, but it's it just it gets, in, it gets insane. But I want to thank you guys for the opportunity, um, for this money, and uh, for helping me get to the next level in my business. Yeah, well, it um, sounds like it's working well for you, and that's good for all of us, yeah. In what county? Addison. Want to run for Senate? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. We love our part of Addison. I live in Addison. Jesus. Oh, yep. I live in Addison in Addison County. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I'd say that well, from anywhere. Well, keep up the good work and uh, good luck to you. Oh, well, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Ethan. Well done. We'll be yeah. back next from uh, Vermont Natural Forest Products. Yeah. Hi, I'm Levi Irish, and I actually wear a couple of different hats. I am the Director of Business Development with Vermont Natural Forest Products located in Richford. I'm also the Co-op and Work-Based Learning Coordinator for Cold Hollow Career Center and Richford and Enosburg High Schools. So I have a primary focus on forestry with the Career Center recently to drive programming to meet future regional workforce needs, especially in regards to technology and in the industry. As we're highly dependent on changing workforce, and we know that we're losing 50% of our workforce roughly in the next couple of years with only 20% to replace that. So the NFP, Vermont Natural Forest Products, is a sawdust shavings, mulch, and heating pellet mill located on the northern, in the northern border town of Richford. It's co-owned by two former graduates of Copala Career Center, um, a logger, Matt Gregoire, and a trucker, Josh Jarvis. Due to their interest in keeping their way of life alive, industry, and local communities, Josh and Matt, always forward thinking, saw an opportunity with great potential. Their dedication, grit, and Yankee ingenuity being drivers of growth for this project. Kohala Career Center serves Franklin County High Schools across industries, specifically in forestry, led by a board of industry professionals, one of which is the co-owner of the NFP, another of which is Charlie Hancock, who we heard from earlier today. So, um, so this facility was purchased in December of 21, and it was inoperable at the time of purchase. Now Historically, that's, that's the plant that sets over in the back as you go out of Richmond. Yep. Yep, right on Hardwood Hill Road. Somebody from down country just on that? Yep, that's what I'm getting ready to talk about next. Thanks for leading me into it. So um, this has been owned by two owners previously who were not physically present. One purchased for their son and um, most recently by two out-of-state owners. They had wonderful theory but limited practical knowledge. 
That's not the case with the current owners. There's nights where things have broken and we find ourselves, myself included, shoveling sawdust until midnight. Like everybody just jumps in where they need to be. The current team is a dream team. Locals with incredible practical knowledge. This team has so many of my personal former students that I've had since like well, second great. grade. Yeah, yeah, great. yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> and a lot of our um, employees will say that they weren't super successful in school. And that's what we see when kids get to Cold Hollow is that they realize that they're industry leaders and that they're successful for the first time. Um, that's the tech center. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 It's great. So Ryan's a chair of education. Oh good, we're gonna to get to know each other. Yeah, it'll be great. great. Perfect. So um, so I couldn't be more proud or more impressed with the group of people that I get to work with. It's amazing because their vision is electric and the owners allow us to not only join in their dreams, but they also let us build our own. I started as a volunteer grant writer and I made my position to every single thing that I've wanted it to be. They have a growth mindset and we hire and grow employees, helping them to meet their personal goals. So in fact, right now, we currently have um, two working on their CDLs through a program with Pro Driver Training and um, Cold Hollow Career Center started by Josh Goss, our forestry teacher there. And we've got funding through Department of Labor and through Pathstones for people to increase their career goals. And we're looking at tier two IRC funding as well now. So first program like that in the state and we're um, serving both students and adults in that now. So the Working Lands Grant of $250,000 is allowing us to update the faulty, outdated, and inefficient equipment. We've been able to replace a debarker using four motors to one use, utilizing only one motor. We've been able to update the yard, increasing efficiency and reducing waste, as well as increasing storage. We've also made technological updates in the pellet mill, including an electrical room um, and operating system, all run from a computer room. Due to this, we're now able to employ six part-time employees, two of whom are current CHCC students, and eight full-time employees. Of these, six are graduates of Cold Hollow Career Center, including the owners, as well as host multiple students for learning experiences on site. One amazing opportunity is when we were able to host both um, our secretaries of ed and secretaries of ag, Dan French and Anson Kevitz, I don't want to minimize a mill experience, but I think a highlight for me is when my Be Real went off and there was generations of people doing Be Real at the mill from Anson to my students. And it was just such a cool opportunity to have technology play a role in what we were doing that day. Um, without this grant as a business, we would not be where we are today. This grant has allowed us to get all aspects of production online, but further, it's allowed us to create meaningful relationships with the next generation of industry professionals and create an amazing support network throughout the state and region. We work with consultants from Hancock Lumber in Woodstock, Maine, connected with the Northern Forest Center, Farm and Forest Viability, and we get to work with Jenny Hull through Follow a Farmer. Um, and interestingly, uh, it sounds like Tucker Riggs is up this year potentially so he's got something in laughing stock farm is another place that we're starting to work with and dr steve bick i believe is a recipient as well loggers uh ben la and ryan whitaker just to name a few people that we're working with now because of this grant we've been invited to present at the northern forest center um to be part of their forest future um sorry at the northern forest center webinar with students and participate um, in statewide research we're elated to have been part of the forest future of both Vermont and the region. And I personally have found myself learning all aspects of forestry, not to mention that I have gotten to operate heavy equipment, including payloaders, dozers, forwarders, harvesters. I've gotten to drive truck now. And I love this team because they're always ready to teach anybody anything. We're able to keep local dollars local by providing a source of income for local loggers and landowners, as well as a market for previously unusable low-grade wood. It was staying in the woods. My favorite story of localism is that the only farm left in Richford is L.F. Herdebees and Sons. It's a farm I grew up on. It's my uncles and my cousins now run it. Um, we truck their timber to the mill, and then we get to create the bedding that goes to their herd. Oh, wow. And it's all staying right in town. It's so like, that's very close to my heart. Um, I don't know a lot of other ways that we can see localism so evidently. We're able to provide a locally sourced heating pellet at a reasonable price, providing a resource for an underserved and isolated community. Further, we're able to support local economy through having this facility 
um, in one of our most at-risk communities in the state. I grew up in Richford. I'm a single mom. I'm raising two daughters in Richford. And what I can tell you is so hard is to keep the young people here. We know that that's a statewide problem. And to create lasting change in a community with limited resources. And speaking as a former first economic development coordinator, um, I know I wear a lot of hats. This is definitely my favorite one, though I earned it. <laughs> um, this mill has the ability to accomplish both of those things. Um, this meets Richford's historical mill town feel in a way that keeps, uh, keeps and advances with the times. In the small town of Richford, with a population of under 2,500 people, we're able to create a product that keeps 80% of the money in the state, as opposed to fossil fuels, which is closer to 40% or less. We're able to help Vermont meet its energy goals through reduction of fossil fuels, as well as decreased tra tra transport of timber and products. But another amazing aspect of this grant is a natural relationship that's developed between VNFP and the local education system. We are elated to call ourselves the first demonstration mill in the state of Vermont and possibly New England. Due to the connections built between the owners and I with the support of Cold Hollow Career Center and Franklin Northeast Supervisory Union, specifically the forestry program under Josh Goss and Richford Junior Senior High School, we're not only able to support learning, but students are knowledgeable <laughs> enough about our practices that they can co-lead tours with our staff. Where others may talk about wanting to encourage the next generation, we're actively engaging in it already. Along with continuing the work we're already doing, we look forward to becoming a regional supplier of heating pullets and mulch, continuing to update the mill and increase hiring and the skill level of the workforce, continue to work closely with Cold Hollow Career Center to offer industry training and accreditation in a real and tangible way that can lead to increased numbers in adult ed in Franklin County in a way that's valuable for local employers. So having the local employers drive that, whether it's skid steer training or log loader training, um, something like that. Offer on-site operation safety trainings through to our students through Cold Hollow Career Center. So we are incredibly grateful to Working Lands and we are incredibly grateful to you all for the support that you have given because it is, it's changing lives. So thank you. Great testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Now you make you mentioned wood pellets. So yes. you do wood pellet, sawdust. Shavings and mulch. Oh, so you do four different products and we do. Yeah, that's great. It's awesome. It is awesome. And uh, yeah, and uh, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So all I want to know is when does Brian and Ethan and you sleep? Oh, we do. No, we don't. We don't. It's not a thing that we do. Because <laughs> it sounds like you're going 24 hours a day. Yeah, we're definitely passion driven. Our entire team is passion driven. Yeah. And it's clear that like this is what you guys are dealing with too. I don't think Josh sleeps. No, he never does. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, it, uh, well, it's great to yeah, it's hear terrific. these stories <laughs> and, and, you know, we're, <clears throat> it's all we had to do is set the, help set the program up and find a, a little money to make sure it went in the right direction. And, and of course, that's a, an ongoing battle. But, you know, with stories like we've heard this morning, uh, if we could get all 180 of us, our colleagues, uh, to hear those same stories, yeah, it would, uh, wouldn't be hard to uh, get the money that we need to put in the budget. But um, we've always, I guess we've always been used fairly well without, you know, losing an arm or anything. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's rewarding to hear your stories, uh, get how this helped you get started and going and, and you know, it, it, it'll put a, a lot of these young people that you're all helping, it'll, you know, give them a leg up to make, hopefully make it a little easier for them yeah. in the future. So. Stick around, too. Yeah. 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 Right. It would be great to talk about CTEs. Yes, let's please. Yeah, time. that'd be great. Yeah. An exchange number. You know, we're working on some things related to that, trying to make it easier for young people to access mm -hmm. these career, yeah. you know, opportunities. Yeah. And not just, you know, every, just really for everybody, but, you know, no matter what you want to do, if you can learn something else, it's a huge asset. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Yeah, great. And I think I just want to make sure that I let you all know we would love to have you come visit. I know that you're all busy, but oh, any time nice. that you would like to, we'd love to have you up. So. Oh, I, I was in on getting the uh, power in there so they could do four phase. Yeah. Uh, or three phase. Three phase, yeah. Because it was off in Timbuktu and they couldn't run the mill efficiently in a few years back, maybe five or eight. I mean, you lose track of, of the years. But I know the owner was from Connecticut or Massachusetts yep. or some ways. Uh, but we got the co op in there. So you got three phases. Yes, we do, and we're grateful for that. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. You bump your leg Farmer's Day at Jay Peak. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh. I just had surgery last Friday, so a couple new pieces in my knee that don't belong to me anymore. Oh. <laughs> it's about a year and a half of healing time. So. Yeah. Really? Yep. Really? I did it right. I didn't mess around, and then I went down on one leg, so I was not going to let all those farm boys think that I couldn't keep up with them. <laughs> <laughs> So, Allison, uh, I think, that is great. that the last speaker? That's it. You did great, Senator. Kept us on time. Wonderful questions. <laughs> and, uh, really, we appreciate uh, your time this morning. And uh, we're going to be moving our crew over to House Ag now. So, thanks for being kind to us. Kind to us. Yeah. yeah. We're available uh, anytime. Thank you. you. It's a good Why thing you had these folks with you, or I wouldn't have been. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Take care. Nice yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Can you run to the bathroom? Yeah. Well, so, are you the best? Brian, thanks. Good to see you. Thanks.